In the heart of Kansas City, Kansas, lies a tapestry of small brick and mortar businesses waiting to share their stories. From cozy cafes to quaint boutiques, each storefront holds tales of resilience, passion, and the courage to chase dreams. Join me as we uncover the vibrant entrepreneurial spirit of these local gems. Together, let's celebrate the triumphs, navigate the challenges, and ignite inspiration in our own backyard. Welcome to Kansas City, where small businesses thrive and stories unfold. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we have the opportunity to sit down with Mike Simmons, the owner of the shop, The Cigar Lounge. Yep. You know, you're going to have to correct me if I said that wrong. Nah, you said it good, man. I, I, was, I was working on trying to make it smooth coming out of the <laughs> mouth, so um, we're honestly honored to sit down here with not only somebody who is an entrepreneur in the Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri area, and everyone knows how challenging entrepreneurship is, so yes. we always have to clap our hands up for taking the risk, you know, taking yep. the risk to go out there and invest capital in something as large as this space. So I'm excited to jump into it. Um, but but also, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a member for 15, 16 years of law enforcement. Yep. So putting his life on the line for the community, taking taking himself, putting himself second and thinking about how can I provide, you know, resources, safety, service to my community and protect my family. So we obviously have to honor and clap up for him. So if you're at home listening, watching, Make sure you're clapping. Yeah. Mike Simmons, welcome to the show. Thank you. Absolutely. That's so a hell of an intro, man. That, you know. You're going to start doing that every time, Isai. <laughs> I'll get better and do yeah. it again. Um, the first question of today is sometimes a hard question for people to answer, but who is Mike Simmons? Ah, Mike Simmons. Uh, so Mike Simmons is, one, an entrepreneur. I've always had that, always had that, uh, that mindset, and I'm a family guy. Like, that's how I was born, you know, family first. And then I, I, I always love to give back, too. That's that's kind of a few things about me. Like, family, I've got that business mindset, and always trying to help people and give back. So, When did when did that entrepreneurship, I don't know, bug or, or energy start to kind of dig up your stomach and to your chest, yeah, get to the yeah. heart, and finally, you know, get established with, you know, 2022, sure. leaving law enforcement? And jumping into the cigar yeah. business. So I, I've always had that entrepreneur mindset. I went to school for business at K-State, and I always just wanted to own something. I always had that mindset. And, like, I grew up, like, even though my dad was a police officer and my family were all law enforcement, but it was like everyone still had a side business. Like, my dad had a lawn care service. He did snow removal. He had a security business. So He's constantly working on, you know, being an entrepreneur himself. And I saw that and it was just like, I always wanted to be my own boss. I had all these ideas I always wanted to do. So I got into law enforcement kind of, you know, just, I needed a job that I fell in love with it. And then, so I did that for 15 years and it was really the last two years of my career where I was just like, I need to do something else. Like had that itch to do something else. And I always wanted to open up like my either bar restaurant, but then I got into cigars, you know, when I would, when I graduated from the academy in 2012, and I was like, "This is it! Like, this is what I want to do." So that bug came in two or three years before I retired, and I was like, "All right, I'm ready." So just kind of planning and get my business plan ready and everything ready, and then just leaped. I love it. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So 2012, you got introduced to cigars. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, and then you know, obviously for 15 years, you're in law enforcement. You decide in 2022 or 2023 to 2022 is when 20 I left okay yeah, and then you open I this think. space in <laughs> and then i opened this up in 2023 march 2020 march 2023 yeah. so the cigar lounge industry the law enforcement industry you know people who are watching at home or people who listen to this podcast a lot of the guests that i have on are minority entrepreneurs yeah. right those are two industries people probably wouldn't associate with the black brown Latin, any, any, yeah. any community in that space, yeah. they're not thinking cigar lounges and mm -hmm. they're not thinking law enforcement for whatever reasons mm -hmm. that we could get into another time. Right. Yeah. Did you face any backlash for them, whether, whether it was your community or obviously it wasn't your family, your, your family, but maybe on the entrepreneurship side, any backlash in terms of like, Hey, 
are you sure you want to take this leave? Are you sure you want to go into cigars? Like, I don't know anybody in this community that owns a cigar lounge. We yeah. don't have any, you know, anybody ahead of us mm-hmm. that could show us the way. Like, did you get any backlash from that? Yeah, it wasn't too much backlash, but it was a lot of people trying to second guess, you know, you sure you want to open a cigar lounge? Like, maybe you should do, a, like, a restaurant or a bar. Like, How'd you deal with that? How'd you deal well, with that? Well, it, it's, I, I, I'm the type of person, like, if I have my mindset on something, it's hard to change it. Mm-hmm. And, like, I knew what I wanted to do. I've been... You know, I've been in the cigar just like lounges and researched it for 10 years by that point. And I'm like, I, I know where the money is. And I'm not only doing it for money. It's just something I really wanted, really wanted to do. And like, I just, I knew, I knew if I had the right business model, it would succeed. Mm. And that's what, the, you know, with anything. Yeah. And I really put my mind forward to the cigar lounge. So a lot of people told me like, don't put it in a Wyandotte County. Don't put, you know, don't open a cigar lounge, you know, don't do this and that. And I just kind of cut the nonsense because I knew, you know, a lot of people, they try to be helpful to try to give you advice, but sometimes it's more hurtful than helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you have a plan and you're prepared, it's just about executing and kind of like you shared, you know, you're an individual who, if you have your mind set on something, mm-hmm. it's going to be pretty hard to change it. So in the light of that, um, what's one, some, what's, what's one thing that you believe to be true personally that a lot of people disagree with. So if there's anything, and it could be anything that comes to mind, uh-huh. um, but what's one thing that you believe to be true? It might be about how someone should run their business in the cigar mm-hmm. space. It might be about law enforcement. It could be anything, but oh, one man, thing you believe to a, be true. That's a loaded question. I know, I know. Go uh, with the first thing that comes to first mind. First thing that comes to mind. So I'll go with my, my, my business model. Is So my business model is way different from a lot of other cigar lounges because I don't have, I don't have, I only have one TV. So I don't like to stretch this on the wall. So I really want this to be a space where people come, talk, interact with people, and like a, be a space for community. Like I don't like there just to be someone sitting there and vegging out on the couch just watching a game. Mm-hmm. Like this is not a sports lounge. And yeah. the people know that. And so that was a lot of people told me like, oh, you need more TVs. You need this and that. Like it's not what I want to do. And let's see here. I mean, that's one thing with the business model. And another thing is with me personally – it's I live by the whole model of like do what makes you happy, mm-hmm. and that's that's always always been like me. And so if I don't want to do something, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Like it's life's too short not to be happy. Absolutely. So that is yeah. I've been like that for a long time. So I love it. Yeah, I yeah. love it. I love it. And you know, like we talked about at the very beginning, entrepreneurship is a very risky thing. Mm-hmm. But if you know that you're going to enjoy, it, if you have a plan. It's worth it to go do it because you can always come back to a job, right? So on the topic of risk, Mm -hmm. obviously we have opening up this lounge, Mm -hmm. but what's one other thing in your lifetime that you feel like was a very risky decision that you made, but it paid off? Oh, I mean, that's just uh, getting in law enforcement Mm -hmm. first is that's a risky because, you know, you know, you, I got into law enforcement to, to really serve my community and it's. Like get into law enforcement. My favorite thing was just being that you kind of have that superhero role that I like people like, like I get to help people. Mm-hmm. And like, once you help people, people say, thank you. And you just like, like kind of fills your cup. Yeah. But at the same time, it comes a lot of risk with that because you know, just not, you're just not only helping people. You're also getting the bad people off the streets. You're getting into dangerous situations. You're getting shot at. I mean, like you never know what situation you're going to get into. So that was probably one of the most riskiest things I ever done. Same. But I, Going back to entrepreneurship, though, I tell people this. The scariest thing I've done was open up my own business. Mm. And a lot of people are like, what? Like, I've been shot at. I've done a lot of crazy things. I did SWAT for a long time. But the scariest thing I've done is open up my own business. And that's really just because you're, you're betting on yourself. Yeah. Like, you know, it ain't, ain't nobody doing it but you. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you, know, you got to put your that. eggs all in one basket, really. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And when you think of challenges or obstacles – what are what is one or a few challenges or obstacles that came up that you didn't expect? You know, I would in my head assume like, all right, you know, 15 years in law enforcement, there's a lot of extreme situations you're put in. Um, there's a lot of challenges you run into. So what else could, you know, yeah. kind of phase you? So mm-hmm. what's something that did phase you in the process of opening up the cigar lounge where you were like, fuck, like, well, fuck. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of people don't know this. So when I first opened up, I had a mentor I had and he lived down in Florida. I met him. Out in Florida when my sister got married, and and I, I told him I wanted to open up my own cigar lounge. So he was like, "Cool, man, I'll I'll help you out." He he opened up a few of them, and he was like, "You know, I'll, I'll I'm here if you need anything." So I'm not gonna blast his name out because I'm not like that. But like for 
for about six months, I would call him and talk to him regularly for almost every other day, like every week, every other day I would talk to him like, Hey, what do I need to do here? What do I need to buy? You know, what insurance on like anything and everything about how to open up a scar lounge. Cause he knew about it. He's been in the industry for like over 20 years. And so I, I got help from him and he was super helpful. And then when it t- came time to buy product, like all my cigars and stuff, I asked him like, Hey man, how, you know, how do I do this and that? Yeah. 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 He was like, yeah, simple. You know, I'll help you out. And so I ended up buying about $10,000 worth of product and the taxes were, of course, you know, $10,000 tax is a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And so he was like, Hey, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it for you. I'll get it shipped to me and you know, I'll take care of the taxes or blah, 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 blah. And then I'll ship them to you. I was like, cool. So let's just say long story short, the $10,000 worth of product I bought got shipped to him and I never saw it. Mm. And that's just been, been mm. my mentor for six months. Wow. And so that was about two weeks before I opened. So I had zero product two weeks before I opened. That was the biggest hurdle that I had to face. I mean, we, we got through it, but it was just one of those life lessons where you just can't trust everybody. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Wow. And, and whether it's that story or another one, but what that just tells you about entrepreneurship is you have to be extremely scrappy. Yeah. You have to be able mm-hmm. to, what do they say? Pick yourself up by your bootstraps and go yeah. out there and do what you have to do. Yeah. I had no time just to like sit and, you know, you know, and be like, Oh, whoa, me, you know, just like, mm-hmm. Oh, I can't believe this happened. I had no time. You had to I had execute. to get back up and I had to, you know, I had to find a way to make it work. We how, did. How did you? Uh, so I contacted a lot of local people around here. They helped me out and, and I got some product in and, you know, I had to spend a lot more money than I, than I had to, but I mean, a lot of people around here helped yeah. me out and I appreciate that. So, but it was, it was a challenge. I mean, I had two weeks to fill up that humidor and it wasn't full when I had my open a day, but we made it work. I love it. And yeah. you said, you said a lot of people around here helped you mm-hmm. um, outside of the mentor kind of ripping you at the end. You know, he was trying <laughs> to help hey, or you were, you know, trying to receive some help from, mm-hmm. from people in your community and your network. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in a past podcast episode that I listened to that you did, you talked about kind of just what you talked about. No TVs in here because you want people to conversate. You want people yeah. to communicate. So when we think about a cigar lounge, you know, you say it's not actually about the cigar. So what's it about? It's about the environment and the people that you're that you're in there with. So and like this place is breeds that because not only you know you're coming in here, you're you're getting a high class lounge that you're sitting into, but you're also surrounded by people that that want to not only make themselves better, make you better. It's like such a family oriented place around here. Like it's it's and this is with most cigar lounges, but a lot of cigar lounges like you, you can be sitting next to there could be a millionaire and a guy that has a $30,000 job working construction. They could be sitting next to each other and they can find common ground with that cigar or bourbon or anything. Just kind of talking about life. And you don't, I don't think you can find that many places where you're going to get two of those different, you know, people in their lives sitting together in like anywhere other than here. I mean, I, yeah. But it's just that commonality of, of cigars and good conversation. That's what this place is all about. I love it. And and what you say about people from two totally different backgrounds being mm-hmm. in the same space, so much uh, – there's plenty of business books out there that talk about cross-pollination, which yep. is really just like you know a play on the word of bees and stuff, cross-pollinating, mm-hmm. things like that. But it's just about putting people from two totally different backgrounds with different experiences in one space. And what you find is the – you know, guy who runs a garbage disposal company and the guy who, you know, owns 17, you know, Nissan dealerships are able to exchange information and knowledge that ends up helping them in their businesses. Yep. You wouldn't think so, yep. but that cross pollination effect can really, really plays a part. Mm-hmm. So on the topic of cigar lounges um, around the country, what is one thing about the cigar or lounge industry in general that pisses you off? Oh, I think that one thing that comes to my mind that pisses me off is that we get lumped into like the flavored vapes and stuff like that. Cause they're, mm. they're trying to outlaw those for like the younger use and stuff yeah. like that. And they're just trying to ban them in, you know, in general. Mm-hmm. And so cigars get lumped into that a lot because they think flavored tobacco, they think that a flavored cigar is the same thing as a flavored vape. Mm. And so they lump it all in one. I mean, I, I haven't seen it, but I don't know if anyone's ever seen a 17 year old kid smoking a flavored cigar. Like it just doesn't, right? like, I no. see enough of them smoking vapes, mm-hmm. but not a flavored cigar or any kind of cigars. And, and the reason why that hurts the cigar industry that they're trying to do away with, you know, flavored products and cigars is that's the number one seller in most cigar lounges mm. and in the industry, I believe. Yeah. 
And so you take that away, you're going to hurt a lot of business. Mm. So that's what, I mean, that pisses me off. But thankfully, they, they shut it down when it went to Congress, I believe. But they're still trying to bring it back. Some people are. Mm. So hopefully that doesn't go through. I agree. Yeah. I agree. We want to see this business continue yeah. to thrive. <laughs> um, so going back to law enforcement, 15 years, is SWAT, being a detective, being a cop, um, a police officer, to be more respectful. Mm-hmm. Anything is it anything like they portray in the movies? Like, or <laughs> when you think about <laughs> when you think about Bad Boys with uh, what is his name, Will Smith? When you think about uh, you know, I don't know, all these different movies from the past. Like, is there anything from a movie in your head right now where you're like, here's a good example of what it's like? Probably none. None. <laughs> <laughs> because the thing that people don't realize is there's so much paperwork being a detective, mm-hmm. and you just can't. You just. I always love the movies where you have a detective and they get a case and they work on it for months. And that's the only case they got. Like they weren't doing shit before that. I'm sorry if we, I don't know if we cuss or not, but, but it's just like, there's a lot more that goes into just finding bad people. There's a lot of paperwork you got to do. Like if a detective, you just don't have one case, you have like 30 cases you got to work in. And so you just can't, you know, put your time just to one case. You got to spread your time out on each one. I mean, the best, I guess, the, uh, the most relatable thing is, you know, of course, it's because it's real. It's like the first 48. That's like, yeah, you're watching like the real deal mm-hmm. Holyfield right there. But movie wise, I don't know. There's not very many movies that I can think of off the top of my head where I'm like, that's how we <laughs> do like, it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> um, I love it. I love it. I, I had to ask that question. Oh, no, you know, I, we, I get it all the time. So no worries. We all we all love the movies, enjoy uh-huh. the movies. And we're, we kind of start second guessing our careers. Maybe I should go. Yeah, this I love one. it like, when they get in a shooting and they shoot somebody or something. They're like, all right, all, all good. <laughs> Like, you know how much stuff you got to go through mm-hmm. if that happens. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. So, you know, the last question I want to ask you today is really just about business growth. You know, mm-hmm. when we get into opening a business or any type of entrepreneurship, the goal is to grow. Yeah. Now, some businesses want to stay. Small businesses stay in their neighborhood, stay in their community and never leave. And that's OK. Mm-hmm. Um, they really invest back in the community, they build relationships and they want to be a center for that neighborhood. Yeah. For you. Do you plan on growing your business beyond Strawberry Hill? And if so, what does that look like? Uh, so right now, I I don't have plans to grow. I do want to eventually, if I do open up another lounge, it'll be in another part of the city or another part of Kansas or Missouri. I don't know where yet. Yeah. But as of right now, I want to dig my roots so deep in Strawberry Hill where I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. So that's where I want to put my all my main focus on just making this place the best place it can be. So, I mean, I'm only in year one, so I got to really, like, i have still, i got so much more to do. Absolutely. I know people are like, oh, you're doing great. Like, yeah, we might be doing great, but there's so much more I still got to do. People come here. How do you get them to stay for life? What's what's What does that look like? I, it's, it's really not just me and yeah. not just the environment. It's the people that, like, my members that are here. Yeah. It's really those people help with people wanting to come back and wanting to stay. I mean, I have live music. I have... You know, good cigar selections, you know, I have nice environment, but that doesn't really matter if the people here aren't, you know, they don't mesh well with other people. No, no one's going to come back. And that goes along with the same people that work here. Like it's me, Dave, and a couple other people that work here. And it's really that too. It's like, if you have good customer service and you have good people to work in here, those, those two things matter. Your, your customers that come in and the people that work, it doesn't really, I mean, it matters a little environment and all that stuff, but it really just, if you got a good staff and you've got good people that are coming there that are helpful and that are that treat everybody like family it doesn't matter who you are they're going to want to come back mike simmons the shop the cigar lounge thank you for your time yeah, today thank you man appreciate you and hopefully the people at home agree that you are a voice of value thank you for joining us thank today. you man appreciate that